How's it going, everyone? Dr. Frankie Bashan here for another episode of Love, Laughs, and Lessons. And again, we are in our matchmaker series, and we have another fantastic matchmaker on today who we're excited to introduce you to. But before we do that, my co-host is going to take over. Yeah. Hey, everyone. It's Denise Ray here, and we're super excited. We have Joy of Joy of Romance, another name that is just like so delicious. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Joy has been the guiding individuals to their personal best and partnership, helping them co-create th thriving relationships. Um, Joy is a relationship mentor for both singles looking for their forever partner and for individuals in relationships striving to make their partnerships better. So she's also a private investigator, and I definitely want to hear more about that. But she's also a private investigator for her single clients, Hearts, a.k.a. an international elite matchmaker. This is going to be really interesting. Yeah. Recently, she's become um, an officiant. So, you know, she's added that after her title, after a couple of happy clients asked her to marry them. Love it. Before the pandemic, she regularly created and produced and hosted dining experiences with the last playful series known as Devoured. So I know that there are some raspberry marshmallows. There's some chocolate, hot chocolate, some Aztec chocolate, hot chocolate, and lots of information that Joy has to share. So welcome, Joy. I just am so happy to meet you. And I want to hear all about how all of this intertwine magic happens the magic <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh well i'm i'm delighted to be on this i've known frankie since before she was a matchmaker so this is very exciting to have it just blossom into all the magnificent things that you've created and denise to to get to meet you after i've seen you um play with her on the screen for a bit so yeah i'm excited just to share what makes me a little bit different than other matchmakers <laughs> Yeah. We're excited to hear. So tell us from the beginning, how did how did you get your start? Yeah, so 19 years ago, I had been married. Uh, my partner and I were together for almost 10 years, married for seven of those, worked together, and we were hitting some major bumps in the road. And I had this aha, how do we get back to the good stuff that started in the beginning? And at that time, it was really the infancy of anything online that had to do with coaching. That wasn't really a part of online experience yet. So it was either religious-based ways to fix it or therapy to fix the relationship. Religious wasn't going to be a good fit for both of us. So we tried therapy. And I like what you're dwelling on is increasing, not decreasing. This is not working whatsoever. So we ended that. Thank goodness, knowing what I know now about relationships, um, he ended it quite abruptly, but it helped me be able to move on more quickly. And so at that time, I had actually purchased the URL during that search for Joy of Romance. Prior to working with my husband, I had been a serial entrepreneur. And I thought, you know, what? I will always love love in some way, shape or form. This really looks like a fun thing. And also science was finally catching up with self-help books to let us know what made relationships thrive or what was causing the demise. So I went back, got my MBA the same year I was getting my divorce. <clears throat> divorce took 17 months, MBA took 13. <laughs> and uh, then I spent the next year traversing across America to my favorite coaches, authors, therapists, neuroscientists, biologists, social anthropologists, everybody who I could find who was touching on something to do with that science component. And originally my primary avatar was men because I felt that women talk about relationships it's innate. We just do it. We have lots of resources. And for gentlemen, I thought this is great that it's getting their minds involved with the science. And if I can do that and then help fully integrate them, I would create more emotionally intelligent men in the realm of relationships. So um, probably still to this day, it's about 70% men to 30% of women that I work with. And from that, um, I didn't really know I was going to go into matchmaking per se. I felt like I had been matchmaking since I was in high school because I just love making connections with anybody, whether it's a friendship or auto mechanic or hairdresser. It's like the connections uh, were just easy for me to be making with people. Um, but I had found out about what was called 
then the Matchmaking and Behavioral Sciences Institute, which no longer exists in its full entity, but we had a very intensive training that I found out right before I was starting my uh, MBA program about, and I thought, oh, perfect timing. I've got this window before, you know, that starts, and um, it was fun. However, I didn't really like the glossy magazine matchmakers so much that I met there. So I, I kind of pulled back and was like, okay, I'll just kind of be on the edge of this for a bit. And uh, it wasn't until about a year and a half later after hosting so many classes and events that I had three people in one day ask me to be their matchmaker for them in the new year. We call it Matchmaking Friday. It was a Friday after Thanksgiving. And then I gathered three of my good girlfriends who each had very different social circles. And I asked them to come together for dinner because I said, I would like you guys to be my love agents. And they said, we have no idea what you're talking about, but you cook really well. So we're coming over for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had a, a time to tell them what I liked and what I didn't like about the industry. And so I said, if we were the clients, how would we want this in a different way? And so at that time, we started uh, pretending as though we had different profiles to apply to different matchmakers to do our research and see what we liked about the process, what we didn't like, and learned a lot from that. And I wanted to be more inclusive. Um, that was um, you know, very important to me to not discriminate on age or gender or anything like that. And I also had been doing all this research on what makes us understand ourselves and our relationship blueprint, what makes us be able to um, choose wisely based on that and how to set that foundation. So it was very important to me that I start with that relationship blueprint so that people had a running chance of being able to succeed in whatever introduction that I was going to you know, make for them. So that was the beginning. <laughs> and that was 19 years ago. And what has it evolved to now? So what are you doing now? Yeah. So how, um, how I kind of wrap my head around loving uh, the component of matchmaking was this deciphering of who somebody is with their relationship patterns. I go, okay, which of these patterns are just core to who you are? So if you understand them, you're not blindly piloted by them. Sometimes when you see two combinations, it might be an oil and water combination in and of your own patterns. So you're inadvertently confusing someone, not knowing any better because that's just who you are, but someone who's falling for you is going down a path and they start future scaping. And if one day you went down, down path A instead of path C over here with them, they'd be like, okay, I still like her, but that's kind of weird. I'm going to gloss over that, sweep it under the rug, just keep moving forward. But your body remembers that as a micro PTSD moment. And in the future, when you need to be vulnerable with them and open up, your body went, eh, I'm going to keep this up a little bit instead of bring it down when it needs to. And then the last component is figuring out which of these patterns are a weak link, either a primary or secondary part of that pattern. If we understand that, then we start working on ourselves, figuring out where that came from, figuring out who we want to be as our highest self. And once we've moved forward with somebody, a place where we can trust them uh, with this information. We start gifting them with helping them understand who we are and requesting of them to see us as our highest self and giving them tools to help us become more stable and grounded when we do go into our weaker link self. So knowing that it was just really core for being able to, to help people and to keep that alive also when I'm working with couples and to go, if you get this early on when all the love drugs are really high, then you're going to be able to use that. I call the love drugs, the sticky sauce, the habits become much more easy to integrate. And then if you see this is a unique we that's never existed before, this is your baby. You have to treat it like that. You have to give extra special attention in the beginning. And if you understand how this person sees the, the languages through their patterns and this one, you'll be able to put together a more proactive way to deal with conflict that's coming from the outside in or internally. And also know that I'm actually choosing you probably because you're going to poke me in just the right ways that I need to grow. And if you use that as a knowledge of this as a spiritual growth a tool for me to be in this partnership, and if we put some 
blanket statements down in the beginning about not wanting to hurt one another or hurt the relationship and really live into that, then you guys grow more and more rapidly. And when things come up, you're not stuck in that little hamster wheel. You can move on to something bigger and bigger. And then I loved Gottman's quote, um, the Gottman, 69% of all marital issues stick with the couple through the lifetime of their relationship. Um, I heard that. I'm like, that sucks. And that's one of the main things I want to try to fix. <laughs> so, right. Right. Yeah. Before the so, lifetime happens. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, now with a new book that I just got fight, right? Yes, I know. I, I was signed up for that, but it, it just came out. Right. Yeah. And so far it's some of the same research that I already know, like the five, one rule and all of that. But um, I'm sure that there's going to be juice, like every book that they publish, I end up getting really important, good nuggets of information that I use in my practice, like probably every day, you know? Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm going to say I've been listening to them because they've been on the circuit because of that book. One of the crazy statistics that Julie quoted in a recent uh, interview was that one of the gentlemen who started OkCupid, okay which by the way, um, Steve Dean, I don't know if you've met him before, he's the number one consultant for all apps and dating services. Wow. He's on over 300 sites. You should interview him, awesome guy. New York um, is where he's from. And so he said all the algorithms of online dating apps and sites suck and they're just meant to make money for the owners except for OkCupid okay, if you answer enough questions. However, it's still like, in his book, he thought it was like 400 to one that you got a good one. Well, oh. the guy who started OkCupid okay, said, no, we did our statistics. It's 50,000 to one chance that you're going to find somebody. 50,000 50, to one. 50,000 to one. That's insanity. But wait a minute, what's matching on there? People are still using dating apps. Yeah, 50,000 to one. <laughs> But but the, they're gonna find their life partner. That they're gonna find their life partner. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So that's yeah. it. That's you can stats. use that to date. Dating for dating's sake, awesome. You know, just to meet people, sure. But sure. the minimal amount of information they give, and then you know, even Steve was saying that they had okay, Cupid had refined some of the really strange questions they used to have, and and had given it more thought. So maybe their algorithms gotten a little bit better. But mm -hmm. I thought Julie, when she quoted that statistic, I'm like, that's why we need matchmakers because that's you know, why we need we, matchmakers. We need that personal touch. We need we need matchmakers who know what it means to make a relationship stand the test. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So. And now I feel like we're on the radar more than ever before because thanks to like TV shows like Jewish Matchmaker. Right, an Indian matchmaker. All of a sudden, people know what matchmaker is. Yeah. Other than oh, like the movie Fiddler on the Roof, uh... <laughs> or Hitch. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Those are the two that I get. Whatever comes up now, it's like they'll turn to oh, did you watch? You know. Yeah. Yeah. But and doesn't love... still go ahead. Oh, Love on the Spectrum. Uh, have you seen that one? I just yes. uh, met with uh, one of our okay. fellow matchmakers who's specializing in people on the spectrum, which I thought was really fascinating. Yeah. Oh, yes, because okay. everyone like loves love. Who doesn't feel good when they feel loved and they can give love and have companionship? And yeah, and I and now they're finding, right, that many more people than we ever thought were are neurodivergent are on, somewhere yeah. on the spectrum. So yeah, yeah, it's needed. Most definitely. definitely. And understanding that yeah there's this is this we that you're creating with somebody has never existed before it's always a unique one of a kind but if you understand those patterns that was what I was going to get to too is that um, I changed my title to being a private investigator for my clients hearts because after the 13 sessions getting really crystal clear on who they were who it was that we were looking for I also do this very strange thing that most matchmakers don't do is I read faces from three different modalities so I studied with Dr. Helen Fisher and good friends with her. I've studied with Dr. Paul Ekman, who created the facial action coding system. And I've studied Chinese facial reading. So when people are starting with me, they give me 10 to 15 images of people they've either been in a relationship with or are very attracted to that aren't models or celebrities. And then 10 images that are close, but no cigar. They can say, that's a good looking person I could see my best friend with. 
but I wouldn't want to kiss them. And so I get to pull out the nuances of why they're attracted to that particular person. And that has helped me immensely in being able to put my, my client's goggles on and see through their lens who they might have chemistry. It's really fun. That's incredible. Yeah. That, and then that is, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, and, and the fact that um, being this private investigator also included, who we go, once we have this profile of who this person is, we act as though we're a chief marketing director, and I go through about 40 questions to figure out about this avatar, and I go, okay, who do I know that's one of my love agents now, who knows that person, and then who do I need to know to become a love agent that might know them, so all introductions are 90% of the time, it's a friend of a friend that's introduced them to me. And then I make the introduction. You said so, something, you, you slipped in there 13 sessions, but yeah. what 13 sessions? Tell us what you're talking about. Yeah. So when somebody is single, it's called the book of me as a partner journey. And we go through their top 10 relationship patterns, which one of the most known one is the love languages, but Dr. Helen Fisher's work, we go through a number of communication um, quizzes, we go through how they handle conflict, we go through their emotional needs, we go through their inventory from their parents and attachment, all of that. And I bring that together and always in the, the last session, which is always recorded, sometimes they record more, but I, I go, okay, all of this tells me this about you, then it tells me what we're looking for in the patterns of your partner. Sometimes it should be this beautiful yin and yang dance. Other times they should be in sync. Then I'll say where their weak links are, where their oil and water combinations are, kind of give them some work to do to continue to become their very best to be able to be the type of person or that person they've told me about. And then we, um, we also work on clearing self-limiting beliefs. And I worked with two incredible psychologists whose major work was around reducing PTSD and being able to see, um, I call it the residual yuckies, anything that is in your past, you're like, and that happened. <laughs> yeah. Starting in utero all the way up to your current age. And then we have a kinesiologist that helps us figure out which of those are sticky points for you being able to attract your most perfect partner and then be able to retain and maintain a thriving relationship. And then I help them understand who they want to be as their highest self because they went through that and where those are attached to their self limiting beliefs. So they create a new vision of where they want to be as their I am statements. And then I do three guided meditations with visualization they help me come up with so that we're getting them scrubbed up and as ready to be ready as possible for when this person comes along. Also knowing that that list that they came up with was gold. And when I figured out this methodology and it was presented to me in such a fun way, but I thought, even if this doesn't do anything, the fact that I get this list and then I get to use this list when they start having problems, because what they're arguing about up here is never what it really is. It's always little kids throwing sand in the sandbox at one another. And if I could get to the heart of that quicker and just let them see it when they told me when they weren't defend, you know, weren't dukes out, you know, trying to protect themselves. And, oh yeah, that happened. Oh yeah, that's who I want to be. It makes it so much like, ah, okay, yes, I don't want to be that little kid in an unconscious, subconscious way throwing sand. I want a pattern and drug and I'm going to give my partner permission to be able to do that with me. So this that's takes beautiful. about two months to get them. Two and a half, two and a half. Like Re rebooted. Rebooted, <laughs> yeah. Relationship ready. Yeah. Yes. And the other thing that it does that is really the anchor of why I do it is that they know without a doubt that they know how to choose wisely. Mm -hmm. And they can do that and they can make that person feel chosen. And they can both deliberately, even if they don't go, you know, I don't know you enough to say you're my forever, ever person, but let's, let's choose three months as a container to go full tilt boogie into this, no plan B, no big toe out the door. And that type of involvement and interdependence isn't happening nowadays with this feeling like you can keep shopping for someone Absolutely. and it's doing such a disservice because you don't get to see the real person if you can't bring all of that down. So that yeah. is really incredibly or do the work that I do that um, also within three to four months, this is prior to the pandemic, the statement was 
uh, within three to four months of finishing their coaching with me, 65% of them had found they're the one. Wow. They found the one. Yeah. yeah. It's and great. Then, then my colleagues started working with me during the pandemic because they didn't know what to do with their people. And uh, they said, oh my gosh, you make our lives so much easier when you work with our clients. Keep doing that. <laughs> Keep doing what you're doing. I bet. <laughs> so, so many people have uh, gone off and did wonderfully well. And then I'll tell you one very strange story in this. Um, so the um, somebody came to me through one of uh, my colleagues and we were in our fourth or I think it was the end of our fourth session, really super fascinating gentleman. And I told him, I said, you have such weird set of patterns that the person who is going to be a good fit for you is teeny tiny little boss. And guess what? You actually had somebody you were engaged to. However, she was deported for being an enemy of the state. So probably not a good person to bring into your family. She had ties to um, all sorts of crazy things in Europe, um, but uh, she was a, like a Bond girl. So very knew everything was really brilliant, um, was very uh, graceful, you know, in different situations and it just kept him on his toes. And so I said, the person you're about to divorce, um, they had had a very tumultuous ending. So my colleague thought he was actually already divorced. He had one signature left that he admitted to me he hadn't signed yet. They had a couple of kids. Um, and I said, your ex, if she would work on that, and you would work on this. She fits in that tiny box, just to let you know. So, you know, you don't have expectations with you know, this matchmaking experience that are unmet um, because it's, it's an odd it's an odd small box that you're looking at. So the next session, he said, I've got a surprise for you. And he pulled his wife on, even though they had a restraining order between the two of them. They said they're divine court actions and said, you know, we're, we fired our respective therapists because they don't want us to be together. Our families don't want us to be together, but we're heading off to another state for the summer uh, to be able to work with you and to see if it'll work. So you've got two months, three months. And so no pressure I, at all. No, no so, yeah. And? So it worked. It worked. Yeah. It okay. Worked. Yeah. And they they feels um, like a lot of pressure to me. <laughs> yeah, it was. I was like, look, well, that wasn't on the plan for today, but okay, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, but you were you were up for the challenge. Really, I got yeah. all right. I believe in what I do. I know yeah. what I'm doing, and I'm up for it. Yeah. So it was, congratulations. That's awesome. That is it awesome. Work. You're doing really um, good work. Thank you. It was so much fun. <laughs> Who are your clients? Where do they come from? Yeah. yeah Who are they? I, I'm lucky that I've been now after all these years, um, been able to service people all over the globe. So um, one of my first attempts at that came where a woman was coming from Shanghai to San Francisco. Her boyfriend broke up with her the night before they were going to get on the plane and decided not to go with her. And so she came by herself and she was just like this. Box. And so she looked up, you know, relationship coach and met with me and we had just had a delightful time. So we, I said, well, if you want to continue doing this, when you get back home, we can do it during Skype at that time. And then I made contact with some matchmakers there and worked in collaboration with them. So that was my first international. And now I've made matches in Dubai, Shanghai, uh, London, uh, Germany, and Canada. So they're all over the place. Um, they're men, they're women. They're usually people who have had some success in their careers. They feel like they're ticking in most areas of their world, except for that house of relationships where they've hit their head a few too many times and or they're at a time where they want to have a family. They've waited for a very long time and they need help now <laughs> without scaring somebody off because they're in that anxious place. And then also a, a good contingency of people. I, I work for uh, people between the age of 26 and 87. I've made two matches for 87 year old. Oh, young. I love that because it's hard, it's right? I describe late. it. Yeah. as a pyramid that it just shrinks as we get older the yeah. possibilities shrink we just have less numbers so yeah and then try being married and then widowed after 
45 uh-huh. plus years and going, what is this dating landscape? This is That's scary. Right. <laughs> and they haven't dated in 50 years. They have no idea what dating looks like today. So yes. yeah, it's pretty cool too. Somebody of that age being open to working with a matchmaker. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. bold for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, I think it's actually more difficult if they were widowed and had an exceptionally wonderful relationship to go, mm-hmm. how does anything compare to that? And you're like, it's not going to, it's going to be just a completely different chapter and being able to open their minds also do feng shui at their home, if they're going to stay at their home. So it's not an intimidating place for a potential partner to come into has been really advantageous in those particular matches. I bet. Yeah, I always notice how like when I move even just like one piece of furniture around in my room, how it like changes the energy, the feeling. It like yeah. makes me happy to see that there's a little bit of a change. You don't even realize like I don't realize, oh, this is time I need to change it up. I'm just like, oh, I'm going to do this because I know it'd be good. And then I just sit there and enjoy the small change. It doesn't have to be big. Isn't yeah. that fun? Yeah, it even is- changing the color out of, you know, your pillows, your bedspread yeah. or something like that will definitely shift the energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I'm I'm curious when you're working with someone that lost a spouse and they are changing the home, what is the what is your advice to them? I know that having worked with widows before, they are reluctant to move things. You know, they don't want to feel like they're being disrespectful to the relationship that they had before in terms of pictures and belongings, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is making sure that the energy of that person is out of the bedroom in particular. So anything that would have been in the closet, any photos that are out in the bedroom, I always say that this is, you need to be able to invite somebody in and have a clear space for the two of you to develop and create that we in this space. And then I'd say, choose one room in the house that has one or two photos um, that you, you know, could be your office, it could be a study, not somewhere really prominent. Some people had them on all over their refrigerator. I'm like, well, it's gonna be a little challenging with that person coming in, feeling like that person's watching them all the time. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then also, oh, I'm actually working with somebody who's a widow right now is my best, one of my best friends uh, passed away about six years ago and her mm-hmm. husband, young uh, kids and we um I knocked like half to a few different times I'm like are you ready yet are you ready yet <laughs> Krista wanted you to like get out there at the right you know when you yeah. to it. and so we um we've been looking at his home because she had been an artist and there's so much artwork around so working with you know what uh, what a, how he could find himself and define himself without defining it just in connection with her so what artwork did he want to put up you know what furniture did he really like and shifting some of it and even if he wasn't ready to give it away he was going to allow some of his friends to have the artwork in their home so he was expanding her to their friends and family which I thought was really beautiful yeah agree that is really beautiful Wow, wow. I'm just, that's difficult. I, yeah, I'm stuck on the thought of okay, this is your best friend's husband, and he's been not wanting to put himself out there for six years, been grieving, and wow, and you're helping in that process of finding love again. Yeah, he's about ready to it's become an updated mens- nester, and he was going, oh shit. <laughs> Like, I, I need to, like, before the last one leaves, I need to at least have gotten my foot wet in this environment. So he did date a couple people, but nothing really serious until, um, it was funny because I had been, um, when people pass away very often, they come to me in birds. And so she was an egret. Um, and I just have had you know, this funny night egret that comes out of my office is near the marina in Sausalito. And I'll hear this egret in the middle of the night and then I'll look across the room and I have a picture of her and I from my wedding shower. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'll message him and I'll message him. And we would go to dinner or something like that. And then this time he's, he was, he came knocking and said, okay, I'm I'm really ready. ready." I'm ready. That's, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's actually reminded me of something I wanted to ask you a few minutes ago. 
just like he has chosen. It's like he knew you were there. And then he has chosen by actively pursuing, right, you as his matchmaker is making me think about what you were talking about earlier about how my feeling or my experience with clients is that they often wait to be chosen. And it sounds like you're really giving them, like helping them access their agency in actually choosing their partner, giving yeah. them knowledge. Very much so. I think that that's super important. When I first started, my model just for the first year or so looked like lots of other matchmakers and there was a quota system and whatnot. And I had a client who's uh, worked for a socialite in town um, and that person knew that she had just turned 41 and she really wanted a family. So she gifted for her birthday the experience of doing coaching and matchmaking with me. And this woman, I just had this impression of her that she would go home at night, put her feet up on the coffee table, grab a remote in one hand and point at me at the other hand and go, you're the reason I don't have somebody in my life. <laughs> and I'm like, no, this isn't it. Like you're, you're working with me. We're working together. Together. We're That's right. This is, this is you. We're showing co-creating. Me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and my, it was, it was blowing me away, but it, it, she didn't value it because she hadn't paid for it also, which I realized mm -hmm. like that, that was the number one Two, Um, she got jealous when I got pregnant. And that was, and it was weird. So I'm like, well, that's odd too. And then um, my number one exercise that I have all my clients do when they first start with me is based on a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt. And she says, do one thing every day that scares you. And I say, if you like the opposite sex, do it with the opposite sex. If you like the same sex, do it with the same sex, but do it with the intention of not necessarily flirting with somebody you want to date, but being, um, a very present in the moment, being able to observe your surroundings, being able to get creative and to think of something a little bit new, a little bit outside the envelope of what you've done. It could be a random act of kindness. It could be a really creative way of, you know, seeing someone and making them feel seen or heard. Um, or it could be something really, you know, scary for you and it's different for everyone. But if you can work on that, you're helping your brain and your optics synapses embrace change and embrace something that's scary and so yeah. I if you keep doing that then you're going to invite in more and that co-creation showing up like that was something she definitely wasn't doing so I I wound up giving uh, the socialite most of her money back and said that this is not this is not a good fit for mm -hmm. us. Mm -mm. but mm -hmm. I changed at that time I did a very odd thing with the way that I matched was I People paid for my coaching program and, and then they could do that one at a time or they could get a discount if there's a lump sum. Then if they wanted to start matchmaking anytime after session three, I would have enough to put a proposal together for them. Then I could start matching and putting their secret ops team of love agents together anytime after session seven. And then um, we would start matching as soon as their package was done. And so um People got used to that. And I said, you know, at that time I had just had a child. I had three stepkids. I was very busy. I had been on the speaking circuit so much that I could barely take on anybody new. There was always a waiting list. So I said, okay, I'm only going to get paid for matchmaking if I make your match and you guys stay together for three months. And I coach on both sides to make sure that you guys get to that three month mark. So it was a little odd. And a lot of my colleagues were like, you're working for free. And I'm like, I kind of. And so I did that for quite a while. Um, it was, it felt like good karma. It didn't give me as much stress. And like I said, 65%, it was this idea of co-collaborating, co-figuring out who and where this person might be, gifting them with different, you know, cool events to go to and things like that. So um, they would often come back to me, even if they did find somebody on their own. And we would do that work, the book of the us as a couple journey together. So mm -hmm. it worked for me for a long time. And then um, probably about five years before the pandemic, I switched and I'm back to going, no, you have to pay a deposit and then you have to pay the fee that I start paying the love agents with. And then but there's always that bonus that comes if they've stayed together for three months. So it helps me, you know, keep active with them and wanting them to be really engaged in that process of putting that foundation down together. And I think mm -hmm. it's really fun because nowadays, 
we don't have the communities that we used to have. We don't have, um, especially sure. with COVID, the, the accountability people mm -hmm. heard gets away with not being accountable like never before. So it gives you, you know, somebody sitting on your shoulder that's me, it's somebody that was the love agent that nominated you, and we're all rooting for you guys to the work. So people yeah. show up a different way. I mean, support. with matchmaking, right? Sure. That's one of the, there's many benefits to working with a matchmaker, but one of them is that accountability. People mm -hmm. want, to, mm -hmm. they want to show up as their best selves. They want, right. They want to continue working with us. Yeah. So they make an effort They're Yeah. They work, they work harder than they would on a dating app, right? They just, there's no, yeah, no one's going to know them on a dating app. Yeah. No ghosting. Thank you. I've only no had ghosting. one person what we thought he ghosted, but he actually flew into some sort of tropical storm and was out of like range for a few <laughs> days. But other than that, nobody's ever ghosted any of my clients. <laughs> Which is oh, a great I, thing. Cause it, yeah, yeah that, here. Right? that ghosting and all of those things that happen on dating apps are, are, are horrible. And the, you know, you can, and you kind of think like, what kind of people would do that, you know? But when there's no accountability, like you said, you never know who it is that you're really talking to anyway. So they can do whatever. It's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah. When I first started, the statistic was 26% of people on online dating um, lied. And those were the liars admitting that they lied. So I'm like, well, of course it's li larger than that. But then now it's 96% of people on dating apps no. say that they I lie. That. I totally believe that. 96%. What are they lying about? The age, height, height, profession, how much they make, um, how much they make, marital status. If they want okay. to be in a so, committed relationship or not. Yeah. Okay, so help That's me understand right. this. Do they not realize that in due time, all of that is going to come to light and they're just going to look like an idiot? Like there's no like intention, I think, for them to really meet people. This is what they do to live vicariously while living their real life. This is a distraction. I think that the apps have almost become, it's entertainment. Right? But it's not a means to an end. Like that's not going to get them where they want to be. So you're saying they're on there. They're on the dating app with no intention of actually finding a partner. That it's just an, a, an, activity, an activity, like scrolling on um, one of the apps. It's an addiction. There, I believe there's a lawsuit right now um, or, or some kind of legal something that's happening against the dating apps right now, right? Because they're, yeah. they're saying that they've been configured to addict you, to keep you on that, the hamster wheel that we're always talking about. But all of them are. Instagram, yeah. Facebook, aren't yeah. they all yeah. designed yeah. To, make, to give us oxytocin and serotonin? Yep. Shots of... All those, yeah. what you were talking about, right? Yeah, all the, the, love, the love drugs. <laughs> The love yeah. talk. So yeah. yeah. So no, they're, they're getting, people are getting their fix. I, I think that there's a small percentage of people that really are hopeful that something is going to happen. Uh, and then by the time they realize that they're not, they're getting off and they're seeking other means. But I think that the larger percentage of people are on there to take, 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 take. And it, I, it, there's, yeah. I'd also put in there that I've seen a percentage of people going the excuse well i'm trying like I'm at least something. i'm checking that box i'm doing something and i'm that doing way. something yeah. while they're building their life and they're being incredibly happy being independent and what is across the board happening is the art of becoming interdependent is a lost art people don't know they didn't watch people do it um this is a big thing um I've been asking for 19 years, please tell me about a couple that you've witnessed that shows true love and devotion that you don't need, they don't need to be perfect. You don't want to have to emulate everything about them. But if there was something you could say, I know they're in love because, and there is something that they do that would be fun to do if I had a partnership. Over 50% of the people can tell me maybe one, if they once in a while tell me two, they go back and do some research, they take that person away, this back to one, and then a whole contingency of people in the 40 percentile range will tell me, can I tell you about a fictitious couple or you know, a couple I watched on television or that I've read about? Is that about Gen Z? Who are we talking about? No, like, no across, across the, the board. board. Across I, the board. Across the board. Yeah. So, yeah. I could, I could totally believe that. 
I will tell you that growing up, I was one of probably, and my friend group, and I was in a dance group um, of 20 to 20 to 25 people, I was one of maybe three that grew up in a dual parent household. So where is this being modeled, right? Right, and I'm going into, you know, the age I'm going into. So yeah, not Gen Z. <laughs> no, and, and even some of the people whose parents did stay together, would you call that a happy, loving, right. happy relationship? What percentage of those that actually- That's right, that that's time? right. They were committed because they were still together, but were they, they happy and thriving and they endured? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Thriving, so, not thriving. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually why I'm reviving my podcast that I had um, started when I first started my company well, about two years in. I did a podcast. It was called Intelligent Love. I remember 411, 411 for men back in the day and approached again with that science mind and took yeah. a, a nugget of science and then turned it into an actionable protocol and made it fun. So um, some of those still exist on uh, YouTube, Vimeo, but not on YouTube. I think maybe one or two, but the Vimeo has a few more. Oh. Um, one oh, was man. called. The, Pull up those had, archives. People can yeah. check you. That's I, like a decade and a half ago. I remember because I had asked you for uh, f a um somebody who could record me. I was wanting to do videos in the beginning, and you had given me a referral, and it was somebody yeah. who could you on that program. So, nice. yeah, nice. yeah, Jeff. Yeah. Yes. So funny. Oh my gosh. Where does the time go? So tell folks, like, how can they find you and yeah, anything you can share yeah. with about how, how they can reach out to you. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for giving me that opportunity. Um, for the last three years, every other Tuesday, I host an office hours and you're actually going to be on my office hours coming up soon. So it's exciting. Um, <laughs> And what day? I, do we know the date? Can we put it out there right now? What is that? Do you remember? Yeah, I think it's the the end of April, April 30th. Okay. Tuesday. Okay. So the last Tuesday of April? Yep, the 30th at uh, seven o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Um, ah. We're going to have a wonderful conversation and it's uh, through Meetup, um, but also if people message me, I can put you on the direct list. Also, majority of those 77 episodes have been archived and so people can watch those it's behind like a closed you know private area and then uh, I'm really excited that this podcast is coming back out so I took the 411 for men this is intelligent love for everyone and I am just trademarked uh, some additional classes for intelligent love and it's going to be uh, evolving into its own being which is exciting um, the podcast will have three different kind of channels to it. One, I'm interviewing those couples who are thriving and uh, understanding, helping people understand what their patterns are and going, hey, if you have that pattern, that pattern, this would be a good couple to watch. Maybe you might want to take something to implement in your upcoming relationship or your current relationship. And talking about people's love stories, it's always just something that lights me up. Yeah. Then I'm going to be talking to my colleagues who have anything to do with love, sex, and food. And we're just going to have dialogues and have fun. And then I'm going to be doing some direct-to-camera work. And also as Intelligent Love Evolves, it's going to be a community. And I'm taking the two courses that I've been doing one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two -on -two with couples into uh, three-month courses each with nine months of access to the community. So once you've learned the material, you can go out and practice it and come back and have access to me during my office hours. So really excited for all of that coming out. I'm actually the LLC becomes the real LLC on Wednesday this week. For oh. So excited about that. Terrific, terrific, terrific. Well, Please tell us. Yes. Coaching. Yes. Is that what you're going to ask me? It's like just, yeah, matchmaking, yeah. coaching um, with couples, individuals. Yep. Yeah. And then the courses, um, there'll be four courses that'll come out um, pretty soon this year. And then in non-pandemic days, I hosted, as Denise said in the beginning, these incredible dinner parties. So Devoured will come back. I'm also looking to expand Intelligent Love. So I'm looking for people that would want to be my coaches in each major metropolitan area. So 
with people when I talk about that. That's another way it's going to be expanding. And I've had this idea in my head since I started Joy of Romance. Um, but just due to life, I had a crazy curveball with a big uh, brain tumor and a car accident. And then my son came along and all of this and the pandemic. I was about ready to launch it right before the pandemic. And so now I feel like I'm ready, ready to be ready. <laughs> it's like so ready <laughs> and excited to take it to this next level. And I think that it's such a really good timing. So many of these influencers who were leaning into the work of Esther Perel and wanting to have just have open relationships without being committed have shifted. And there's five major influencers that have said, you know, one, I'm committing to being monogamous. I want to be able to have one person that I really devote to doing this dance with, and I'm going to do my pre-work. So um, I'm excited that they're finally catching up with what I've been doing for the last 19 years. And people, I uh, hopefully will embrace how to do love and relationships on a deeper level than they have for a long time. That's amazing. Conscious love is going to be on trend. Yes. Right? About yes. time. It's about <laughs> damn time. <laughs> and all the, like everything you do is science-based, which is so important yeah. that there's, that research, that empirical, like all of that data and yeah, to support yeah. the intervention. It, yeah, It helps people make sense of it instead of it just being this feeling based ethereal, like mm -hmm. you can't get a grasp yeah. on it. So I'm, yeah, I'm happy to help people understand though. No, there actually are some good you know things to understand about patterns that will help you choose wisely. Thank you so much Thank you for joining so much. us today. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. I can't believe that time went like that. So thanks for letting me share my stories. Of course, of course. Such a pleasure. All right, listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in. Chris's hugs. Bye for now. Bye for now. <laughs>